Good morning, church. Oh, boy. It's going to be one of those mornings. I'll give you a pass. Let's turn together to Deuteronomy chapter 31. We are studying the book of Joshua, and I promise eventually we will get to the book of Joshua, but we're not there quite yet. Uh, We do want to spend kind of one more week here examining some of the biblical backdrop to the book of Joshua as we prepare for our study and our walk through uh, that important book and chapter in the life of Israel. Last week, we talked about some of the faith tests that Joshua went through in preparation for his role as leader. And I think Ty did a, a helpful job of talking about the difficulty of navigating change and of following a great leader like Moses. And we can all appreciate uh, the pity deserved for men who follow in legends like Vince Lombardi or Winston Churchill, as, as Ty described. But, you know, there was one notable exception to those lists of transitions last week. And I, I'm sure we were all thinking it. We could probably all just say it out loud right now, right? And it's, it's the transition between Adolph Rupp to Joe B. Hall as the head coach of the University of Kentucky men's basketball program. We were all thinking it. (laughs) Rupp, if you'll indulge, coached for 42 seasons at Kentucky. He won 876 games, four national championships. I think Kansas has four national, is that right, four? He has four national championships. He made six Final Fours, let me finish. He was voted National Coach of the Year five times, not to mention over two dozen conference titles in that span. And yes, I know he went to Kansas. Someone will point it out. He's a graduate of Kansas. Put that feather in your cap. That's fine. But as an assistant on Rupp's staff, nobody knew better than Joe B. Hull how big the shoes were that he had to fill. The pressure was enormous. And I don't have time to tell you half the stories about those first couple of seasons. But despite that pressure, Hall, you'll be pleased to know, went on to coach 13 seasons himself at Kentucky before retiring early, no doubt from that pressure, where he would go on to win his own national championship in 1978, go to three other Final Fours, win National Coach of the Year also in 1978, and win eight conference championships along the way. Rather than cave under the pressure, Joe B. carved out his own legacy, so much so that a statue of him stands on the campus of the University of Kentucky, right outside the player's dorm, which also bears his name. Some would say that Joe B. Hall, more so than probably anybody else, is responsible for the University of Kentucky being the greatest tradition in college basketball history. Some would say that. Some would say that. So what does that have to do with Joshua? Well, honestly, not a whole lot, but I had to listen to the history of the Beware the Fog sign last a couple of weeks ago, so I mean, I figure this is fair game at this point. No, seriously, there is a point. There is a relevance to this, and it's to ask the question, to ponder the question together, what makes a successful transition? Why is it that some people continue on the success of their predecessor, whereas others fall short and are forgotten? Not just for the leader, but for the people. What what ensures, what makes a successful transition? Well, the answer to that is uh, worthy of a book in its own right. But I would suggest, especially for our purposes this morning, that one of the important answers comes down to the idea of constancy. Right? In a time of change, what remains the same? And is that constant enough, strong enough, to carry through even in times of perhaps dramatic change. If we stick with a sports analogy for just another minute, and then I promise we'll get off of that. Why is it that traditional powerhouse athletic programs, football, basketball, whatever, why is it that they can maintain dominance across the decades when coaches and players come and go, whereas other programs seemingly are more of kind of a flash in the pan? And again, there's a lot of possible answers to that question, but to me, the idea is a constant. What remains the same throughout the decades for those programs? Often, it's pride. 
It's a, it's a sense of spirit and pride in the program. And, and more than just about a coach or a group of players, to use the cliche, it's not about the name on the back of the jersey, but the name on the front of the jersey, right? It is the pride in that fan base and those donors and the important people and supporters within the organization that endures throughout the, the seasons and the decades such that they will not allow the program to fall behind. And because those things remain constant, the success of the program remains consistent, though individuals come and go. Now, to be clear, neither Ty nor I want this to be an entire sermon series about a a pastoral transition at this church. And I don't want to compare myself to Joshua any more than I'm sure Ty wants to compare himself to Moses. Probably less so does he want to compare himself to Adolph Rupp, where I would be the Joe B. Hall. No, this, this isn't really about that. It's certainly on, the, on our minds, in a sense. But this whole series, this whole idea of transition is really more about how we all approach change as it comes, whether together as a church, collectively as a nation, or just as individuals and family units. It's about the new territories that God leads us all into and the change that accompanies them and how we navigate it. And as we come to Deuteronomy 31 this morning, right on the cusp of the actual transition between Moses and Joshua as the leader of God's people, I think that we will see, and I think that the point of the passage this morning is to highlight to us that no matter how many changes there were to come for God's people, and there would be many, what was far more important and far more significant was the things that would remain constant. It was the things that would not change from Moses to Joshua and indeed would not change into the ages, today and into eternity. And it's those constants that were the key to Israel's success. And if we are to navigate our own new territories, it's those same constants that will be our guiding light as well. So let's look together. Deuteronomy 31, I'm going to read the first 15 verses as the focus of our time this morning. It's God's word to us. So Moses, he continued to speak these words to all Israel, and he said to them, I am 120 years old today. I am no longer able to go out and come in. The Lord has said to me, you shall not go over this Jordan. The Lord your God himself will go over before you. He will destroy these nations before you so that you shall dispossess them and Joshua will go over at your head as the Lord has spoken. And the Lord will do to them as he did to Sihon and Og, the kings of the Amorites, and to their land when he destroyed them. And the Lord will give them over to you and you shall do to them according to the whole commandment that I have commanded you. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them for it is the Lord your God who goes before you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and courageous, for you shall go with this people into the land that the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you shall put them in possession of it. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Then Moses wrote this law and gave it to the priests, the sons of Levi, who carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord, and to all the elders of Israel, And Moses commanded them, at the end of every seven years, at the set time in the year of release, at the Feast of Booths, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God at the place that he will choose, you shall read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Assemble the people, men, women, and little ones, and the sojourner within your towns, that they may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God, and be careful to do all the words of this law, and that their children who have not known it may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land that you are going over the Jordan to possess. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, the days approach when you must die. Call Joshua and present yourselves in the tent of meeting that I may commission him. And Moses and Joshua went and presented themselves in the tent of meeting. And the Lord appeared in the tent in a pillar of cloud. And the pillar of cloud stood over the entrance of the tent. Let's pray. Father, you have preserved these words for us this morning. Speak them anew, we pray. 
they may be relevant, that they may be poignant and profound and press upon our hearts the things that you would have us take away. Shape us through them, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So before we dive in, again, we, we are hopping around a little bit, and it's helpful to get our bearings. So let's briefly walk through some of the biblical history that took place before last week when we saw uh, Israel at Rephidim in the battle with Amalek to now. Rephidim in Exodus 17 is just a short way away from Mount Sinai, and so shortly after that battle that we saw, that we saw last week, Israel comes to Mount Sinai where Moses receives the law of God, and relayed it to the people. They were there for about a year, all told. And really from about Exodus 19 on through the book of Leviticus, even really into the first couple of chapters of the book of Numbers, all of that takes place in that geographic setting. From there, Israel journeyed to a place called Kadesh as they prepared for the conquest. They had received the law. They were now to go into the land. They were supposed to. But if you know the story there, in Numbers 13, they sent out scouts into the land to scout it out to see what it was like and and to bring back a report and to scout out their enemies. The scouts came back full of fear rather than full of faith. Twelve men sent into the land, only two of them came back with faith that God would do what he had said. The ten prevailed and the people rebelled. And so for the next 40 years, it takes up the the rest of the book of Numbers The people, in an act of judgment, wandered in the wilderness, not permitted to go into the land that God had promised because they refused to take hold of it when God had commanded them. And so the next 40 years are filled with grumbling, they're filled with wandering, they're filled with tests, often filled with judgment, but also, as we'll see briefly, some victories and some preparation for what is to come as the new generation was prepared to take possession of the land. When we come to the book of Deuteronomy then, we have them back again on the cusp of the land, ready to take possession, but this time, recognizing the importance, the book of Deuteronomy is a a retelling, a second telling of the whole of the Mosaic law, as if to say, guys, we got this wrong the first time, let's get it right this time. Let us remember what is fundamentally foundationally true, and so the book of Deuteronomy rehearses the law of God And you'll see a lot of overlap between the end of Exodus and Leviticus, and again, a little bit of numbers with what we come to in the first bit of Deuteronomy. When we come to chapter 31, we come right up to the cusp as they are about to finally take possession again, which happens, of course, in the book of of Joshua. And here they are prepared for one of the important changes that will take place, and that is the passing of the torch, so to speak, between Moses as their leader and Moses. Joshua. And here they are told what they could expect and what they must do. And again, as we said, I would suggest that the defining theme of all of these instructions and these reminders is that of constancy. And despite everything that was getting ready to change, the most essential aspects of their lives would remain exactly the same. And so as we journey through this passage, I I have identified three constants for us that I maintain are constant for us today as well. And these are our constants in the new territory. And the first that we'll examine here is the constancy of the power of God for his people. (coughs) And that was a fail, sorry. Moses begins addressing Israel, verses 1 and 2, addressing the obvious change. Guys, I'm old. I'm 120. That's pretty old. I can't do what it takes to lead this people anymore. And further than that, because of disobedience in the past, look at uh, Numbers 20, because of a failure on Moses' part, God had told him that he was not to see the fulfillment of these promises. It would be up to the next generation. It would be up to Joshua to lead the people in. And so Moses isn't going to go. And this in itself is a huge change for, for decades. For decades, Moses has been the guy that was the recognized leader. He was the guy you went to with the problem. If you were going to grumble, which wasn't a good idea as they learned, but if you were going to grumble, you grumbled against Moses. He was the guy. Everybody knew it. 
And so the obvious question, if Moses is 120, if he's getting ready to die, if he's not going to go with us, well, then who, who's the guy? Who is going to go before us? Who's our leader now? And we would expect Moses to say, well, just take all that to Joshua. And in a sense, that's true. But notice that that's not really the immediate answer that he gives. Instead, in verse 3, what he says is, I'm not going with you. I'm not going before you. Verse 3, the Lord your God himself will go over before you. And that's not really a change at all, is it? Because all through the time of the Exodus and all through the time of the, of, of the wandering, even the people weren't really following Moses. No, Moses and the people together were following that pillar of cloud, that pillar of fire, as the symbol of God's presence leading them through the Exodus, through the wilderness. When it moved, they moved. When it stopped, they stopped. And so Moses says, look, I'm too old for this. This isn't going to be my thing. But God's not too old. God's not worn out. He doesn't grow weary or tired. He himself will continue to lead you. But not just as a kind of GPS. He's not just the one kind of charting the path for you. No, he's doing all of it. Again, look at, listen to these verses again and listen to the obvious repetition that you see here, right? Verse three, the Lord your God himself will go over before you. He will destroy these nations before you so that you shall dispossess them. And Joshua will go over at your head. The only mention of Joshua in this paragraph, by the way. As the Lord has spoken. Verse four, and the Lord will do to them as he did to Sihon and Og, the kings of the Amorites. You can read about them. Numbers 21, 22, somewhere around there. These were uh, Amorite pagan kings on the eastern side of the Jordan who opposed the people as they tried to wander through. And God gave them over to Israel as a kind of a, of a proof of concept, you might say. You want to see that you're going to be able to conquer these people on the other side of the Jordan? Well, remember what I did to these two guys. It's a short bit of Israel's history, but it's referenced a lot because it's important. You conquered these guys. I helped you do that. In fact, I enabled you to do that. And so you'll be able to handle what comes. The Lord your God will do to them as he did to Sihon and Og, the kings of the Amorites, and to their land when he destroyed them. Verse 5, and the Lord will give them over to you. And you shall do to them according to the whole commandment that I have commanded you. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do you hear it over and over and over again? God will, God will, God will, God will. And if Israel learned anything from the Exodus and the wilderness, and often they did not, that it should have been that all of their blessings, all of their victory, all of their successes had everything to do with God and his power and nothing to do with themselves or Moses for that matter. Moses didn't convince Pharaoh to let the people go with persuasive speech. Moses didn't part the Red Sea. Moses didn't provide the food and water in the middle of the desert. Moses didn't guide the people through the wilderness to arrive at the promised land. And Moses would not be the key to victory when their enemies came against them. God did all that. And more importantly for the people in this moment, God isn't going anywhere. He's not tied to Moses' regime. Again, verse 6, he will not leave you or forsake you. So we could say that last week where we met a key character in the book of Joshua, Joshua, at Exodus 17, in a very real way, today we focus on what we could say is the real main character in the book of Joshua, and it's not Joshua. It's God. The key actor through all of the events of the conquest would not be a leader at the head of the people. It would be God himself going before the people, enabling them to do all that he had commanded. So then where does Joshua fit in? Well, verse seven. Moses summons Joshua. He speaks to him now directly in front of all the people. Be strong and courageous, for you shall go with this people into the land that the Lord your God has sworn to, the fa to their fathers to give them, and he shall put them in possession of it. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Now, what strikes me as I read that is how similar it is to what Moses just told the people. There's almost no new information in that. It's almost verbatim 
what he told the people. Joshua's commanded to do the same things as the people. Don't be afraid, be strong, be courageous. The Lord will be with you. What that highlights to me is that, again, none of this is really about Joshua. It's about the faithfulness of God. It's about the power of God. Joshua's job as the leader is to keep the people focused on that and to keep the people focused on their faithfulness to God above all else. Commentator David Howard writes, the key to Joshua's success lay not in administrative or military genius, although he appears to have had abilities in both areas, but in his devotion to God. God instructed him that he was to be rooted in the law, and therein would lie his success. Why? Because although the enemies are different, although the terrain is different, although the man appointed to lead them is different, God remains the same. And whatever he has done, he will continue to do. We live in a celebrity-obsessed culture, it seems. And it's one thing when it's the tabloids and TMZ and all that kind of stuff. But it bleeds over into other areas, doesn't it? It bleeds over into the business world or, again, the sports world, right? With rock star CEOs and and larger-than-life coaches and personalities, and sadly, I think this, this cult of personality, so to speak, bleeds over even into the church where a charismatic leader, maybe even one with the best intentions, ends up making the success of the ministry more about their own giftings than God's blessings. And inevitably, when that guy leaves due to retirement, some other opportunity, or worst of all, in some kind of moral failure, a crisis emerges and people begin to ask, well, what are we going to do? Who can lead us like that guy? Who can do what he did? Well, that's the wrong question, isn't it? Maybe a single man can change the fortunes of a major business or an athletic program, but that kind of mentality is completely foreign when it comes to the way that God deals with his people. Victory for God's people is always about what God does a hundred times over before it has anything to do with anything that we bring to the table. If you'll indulge one more Adolf Rupp quote, he said of the transition between himself and Joe B. Hall, he said, if the basketball program fails at the University of Kentucky, then I have built it on a sand foundation. I would have failed, he said. Not him, because it would have been about me. It's not about me. Wise words in many a setting. And if the church is to continue on with the success through the ages, it won't be about whose name is on the sign. It will be about the person and the power of God witnessed and proclaimed. And so whatever new territories that we venture into, never forget that the constant through it all is the person of God. What he has promised He will do, just as he always has. That's not going to change. The power of God remains the same for the people. Secondly, we see the constancy of the promises of God to his people. Look with me again at verses 9 through 13. Moses makes copies of the law. He gives it to the key leaders of the people, the priests, the Levites, the elders of the people. And he says in verse 10, at the end of every seven years, at the set time, In the year of release, which was a special cancellation of debts and freedom for servants provided for in the law, at the Feast of Booths, which commemorates the years of wandering through the wilderness, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God at the place that he will choose, you shall read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Just what they're doing now in the book of Deuteronomy, you're going to do it again. Every seven years. And notice in verse 12, who's invited? Everybody. Everybody. Assemble the people, men, women, little ones, and the sojourner within your towns. Some festivals only require the men to go up and make an offering. This is everybody. This is a national timeout and a gathering. Why? The rest of verse 12. That they may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God and be careful to do all the words of this law and that their children who have not known it 
may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land that you are going over the Jordan to possess. Families were, were continually to recite the law and the works of God to their children. It was to be a regular ongoing thing as a part of the nation of Israel. But this is clear. No one has any excuse. Everybody is going to gather and hear it again. Why was that so important? Sounds like a lot of trouble. Depending on what Moses means, if he meant just reciting the book of Deuteronomy, according to estimates, that would take about two and a half hours. So you with little ones, imagine sitting in a massive throng of people for two and a half hours listening to Deuteronomy. If he meant the entire law, the whole Torah, well, that's about 14 hours. Shudder. It's a lot of trouble. Maybe they split it up. I don't know. There's ways of doing it. Why go to all that trouble? Because the entire exodus, the entire time in the wilderness, and as we'll see over the next several months, the entire conquest of Canaan was all about the faithfulness of God to his people and the faithfulness of the people to their God. Their only hope for victory. The scouts that sent the bad report had a bit of a point. We can't take these guys. Correct. But if you are in right relationship to your God who drove out the kings of the Amorites beyond the Jordan, this is not a problem. It's crystal clear in Deuteronomy 30, just one page over if you have your Bibles open. Starting in verse 15, see, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today by loving the Lord your God, by walking in his ways and by keeping his commandments and his statutes and his rules, then you shall live and multiply and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. But if your heart turns away and you will not hear but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish shall not live long in the land that you're going over the Jordan to enter and possess. If you are faithful, then I will keep my end of the bargain and no enemy can stand against you. If you reject me, if you are faithless, then you have no chance against even the smallest invading force. There was nothing more important to the life and the prosperity of Israel than being in right covenant relationship with their God. And if they must follow the law, then they must know the law. And so they gather to remember and to rehearse the law of God. It's their only hope. It's not about their behavior, but it's about being in relationship with their God. Why do we make such a big deal of the scriptures around here? Why is it every week we're opening the Bible? Why don't we just talk about current events and give some practical life advice? Why are the songs so often rooted in scriptures and, and, and using scriptural ideas and words and phrases? Why are we praying along the lines of scriptural prayers for the people? Why do we gather? We have a Monday night. Tuesday night, Thursday morning, we gather for men's and women's Bible studies. We launched a new youth ministry or a young adult ministry. What are we doing? Studying the Bible. I appreciate Pastor Damon rebranding the midweek high school gathering because calling it youth group means you're going to come and crack jokes and play games. And they probably do some of that too. You know what we call it? It's the high school Bible study. That's what we're going to do. If you go to a life group, you get to talk to people, you get to catch up and visit and fellowship. But you know what else you're going to do? Probably, I hope, open the Bible, talk about it, apply it to our lives. And then we tell you, every day, you should be opening the Bible yourself and reading it. Isn't that a bit much? Is that overkill? No. Not at all. 
Because just as it was true for Israel, it's true for us. There's nothing more important for God's people than to know, love, and follow the word of God. Because no matter what else changes around you, his word never changes. It remains the same. It is our light and our hope for our future. And when everything around us is constantly shouting a different message, message, forming us and shaping us into another image, we gather weekly, daily, to be shaped into the image of Christ because we say that that is the way to true life. I love the way that Martin Luther put it. He said, where God's word is not repeatedly proclaimed in sermons, in hymns, in private conversation so that we may not forget it or become callous towards it, there it is impossible for our hearts, which are burdened with many an earthly pain and sorrow, with wicked purposes and the devil's malicious instigations not to fail and fall from Christ. That's a sentence that only a 16th century reformer could love, so let me paraphrase it. If we don't continually Rehearse and remember the word of God together. It is inevitable that our faith will falter and fail. Thus, he says, it is an urgent necessity that the preaching of the gospel continue among us, that we may hear and retain it. Otherwise, we would soon forget our Lord. That is, in a sentence, the history of the nation of Israel. They forget their Lord. And they follow after cheap substitutes. And they reap the consequences. And so as we go into new territories, new circumstances, we can be sure that we can walk through it with confidence and certain hope if we follow in the footsteps of God. If we follow his word, if we follow in right relationship to him which we know through the word that he's given to us. And if that's true, then we cannot devote ourselves to it too much. Lastly, notice the constancy of the presence of God with his people. Look at this briefly as we close. Verse 14, God speaks directly to Moses now. Before this, this is all Moses speaking to the people, Moses speaking to Joshua. Now God speaks. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, the days approach when you must die. Call Joshua and present yourselves in the tent of meeting that I may commission him. And so they do as they're told. They come, and in verse 15, it says, The Lord appeared in the tent in a pillar of cloud, and the pillar of cloud stood over the entrance of the tent. Now, the significance of that verse may not be immediately apparent, but look back with me to Exodus 33. It'll be on the screen. You don't have to turn there. In verse 9, when it talks about this same tent of meeting, about Moses. It says, when Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. If you skip ahead just a little bit in that passage, it says, then the, thus the Lord used to speak with Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Now, two things deserve notice here briefly. One, the pillar of cloud, again, is that symbol of God's presence and his power. It's settling over the tent It's a symbol of God manifesting himself to Moses in a special way. He's speaking with him directly. But also, the Exodus event tells us that Joshua was around. He was outside. He was keeping watch over the tent. But Joshua wasn't in the tent. That was just for Moses. That was a special thing. When we look back at Deuteronomy, this time, again, Moses goes in the tent. Again, the pillar descends. But this time, Joshua's right there with him. And the implication is pretty clear. Just as Moses enjoyed a special relationship with God, just as he spoke with him in his presence, now Joshua does the same. And if Joshua had no further qualifications to lead the people of Israel, in this next great chapter of their history, this would be enough. This is it. He wasn't necessarily the strongest. He wasn't necessarily the smartest or the most gifted. But he was faithful and God spoke with him like he spoke with Moses. And I would contend that that's the kind of guy you want to follow. 
no matter where it leads. In this new territory with new threats, God's power, his promises, and his presence remain the same. And in that arrangement, they can't lose. It doesn't matter what they go up against. It's often been noted that there's a number of similarities between the character of Joshua, as he's presented in the Old Testament narrative, and the person of Jesus. We could say, and theologians would call Joshua a a type of Jesus, meaning that he's a pattern, he's a foreshadowing that's fulfilled in a greater way in the coming of Jesus. In fact, the the, the very name that we use for Jesus comes uh, from, from a Greek pronunciation that is the same as the Hebrew name Yeshua, which in English we say is Joshua. So to oversimplify it a little bit, the name Jesus is the same as the name Joshua. It's just a different language and then flipped into English. And I don't think it's any coincidence that the similarities extend beyond just a name. And we'll look at several of these connections throughout our time in the book of Joshua. But here at this passage in Deuteronomy, we have one of the most profound connections. Because Joshua, appointed as the new leader of the people of God, was permitted to stand in the tent of meeting where God manifested his presence in a special way on earth. But the new Joshua, the better Joshua, Jesus Christ, does not just stand in God's presence He himself manifests God's presence. He is God's presence where he goes. He doesn't just enjoy fellowship with God. He is God. He is the fullest expression that we have ever seen of the presence of God with his people. He is Emmanuel. He's God with us. And so we too are on our own journey. We're into new territories all the time. And our ultimate destination is our own promised land. Far more than just a tract of land in the Mediterranean, we await a heavenly and an eternal home when the ultimate fullness of God's promises will all come to fruition. And we can have great confidence and hope in that journey because at our head is not just a man of God. At our head is the Son of God. Jesus himself, the better Joshua, as our guide and our forerunner. And as we follow him, we can be sure to be safe from whatever our enemies may hold for us and to be welcomed into God's eternal resting place. And a lot's going to change. In our nation, in our church, and in our own lives, we can be sure of that. But today we sing and celebrate because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So may we stand in awe of him today and follow him where he leads in all of our new territories. Let's pray. God, we rest in your unchanging nature. We are fickle. We change. This life is fleeting but you are eternal and enduring. Your power, your promises, your presence is ever with us in the person of Jesus. May we love, serve, and follow him. It's in his name we pray, amen.